It's worthwhile of my time because I meet very interesting people at FPC. We've developed over time a very interesting and quality base of people, investors, experts, technologists, entrepreneurs, wealth creators, etc. The audience wants solution and they want to know how do you make money in every one of those asset classes. This is what I'm here for, to push the experts to talk about monetization of their asset classes and to basically coordinate with the audience as to they're asking the right questions, the smart questions. If not, they're banned. Welcome, folks, to our second event of the year. For those who don't know me, my name is Ziad Abdelnour. I'm president and CEO of Black Hawk Partners, and I'm a founder and chairman of the Financial Policy Council. We started this organization nine years ago. It's been a long ride, great ride, and uh, more stuff to come. We had 50 events so far. Uh, we have over 250,000 followers, uh, and we're making a difference. And I really hope, other than joining and attending event as guests, that you will be joining us, joining forces in building this great organization. We're fiercely independent. We're not paid or bankrolled by any PAC. We're not Republican or Democrats. We are capitalist entrepreneurs, wealth creators, and we intend to keep it this way. Which today is very refreshing to see such organization, whereby everybody is on the bankroll of somebody else, and everybody is following a very narrow agenda. Independence, clear-minded, focused, making a difference, empowering people, younger people, when I look at this new generation of millennial, oh my God, oh my God, this socialism, capitalism, frenzy, they know nothing, they've seen nothing, and I, they think this is the easy way, that's not the easy way. So we want to turn the tide. We are an organization that wants to turn the tide. We want to create as many entrepreneurs millionaires and billionaires as we can. That's power. That's the true power. When you educate in power and create such a generation. All the rest is for the birds. Being a Republican, being Democrat, voting for this crappy senator or congressman, waste of time. You're wasting your time. They don't give a hoot about you. The government doesn't give a hoot about you. Corporate America doesn't give a hoot about you. Either you kill or you die. Literally, survival of the fittest. When people ask me, this other guy who was interviewing me the other day, he told me, where do you see the future in your industry? I told him, I don't give a right ass about the future. I don't read, I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't read a crystal ball. The key in the future is how you adapt. How you adapt to the future. No matter what happens, who thought five years ago we were going we to have what we're having today? Trump in power, the socialist rise, the millennial acting the way they are, talking about Green Deal, all the scandal, corruption. Who thought this? Did you ever expect this? Could you ever read this? No. How do you react? How do you adapt? That's how you survive. Most of the people today are not ready to ad are not. They don't know how to adapt. They're clueless. They're very influenced by this person or that, this current, this party, this ideology. The last person they think about is themselves. Because it's not good to think about it. You're being, you know, egoistic. You're not being nice. Listen, nobody gives a hoot about you. 
you have to be self-reliant, a cash flow machine on your own, and do what you want to do. Because at the end of your life, the biggest regret you're going to have is, I should have done this. Rather than saying, God, I had the balls to do this. That's what matters. You see the problem, somebody else was asking me, everybody today wants to conform. You're born, you have to conform to your parents. You go to school, you have to conform to your principles. You get married, you have to conform to your wife, spouse. You go and get a job, you have to conform to your boss. By the time you're 56 years old, your life is gone. You've conformed all your life. You've done nothing in your life. You look back, you say, what have I done? Nothing. It's time to collect Social Security and die. Is this what you want your life to be? There's nothing wrong in be a, being a rebel, being a maverick, changing the order of things. What challenging me more, somebody was asking me, what is the most challenging thing? I want to change the order of things. I want to create chaos to make money. You don't make money when everything is hanky-panky. You make money when you create chaos and can navigate through the chaos while everybody else is drowning. You have to think like this. I've been through that. And I'm, you know, I, I have no, you know, this is on video. This is going to be taped for years. I don't care. You think I care what people are going to think when they're going to listen to this? I want them to be scared when they listen to this. At the end of the day, you want to be loved or you want to be feared and respected and right? I got it right. They had an, an ideology. They didn't get anything right. And their life is gone, and they did nothing. I don't think this can be taught. Wisdom cannot be taught. Knowledge can be taught. Wisdom cannot be taught. You're going to have to make the mistake to realize, God, I made the mistake. I better do it better next time. Why I'm doing all this? Why I've been spending nine years, lots of money, to build this organization, to build this message? Because I care. Because I care. You know, when I was much younger, before I came to this country, my father told me, I'm going to give you one advice. And I want you to remember this for the rest of your life. And my father was a super entrepreneur. He told me, this is what it takes to succeed. You have to be with the right people. And let me tell you how you judge who the right people are and how you vet the right people. The right people have three characteristics. This is the only three things that matter. All the rest is for the birds. Your education, your Ivy League schools, the color of your skin, your gender, your religion, your sexual orientation, your brilliance, all this stuff doesn't count. So I told him, well, what counts? What really counts? How can you size up somebody in five minutes and say, this is who he is? I'll tell you what it is. Number one, you're going to have to deal with people who have a lot of guts. Any people who's gonna, anybody who's going to slow you down or put you down, stay away from him or her. Because they're not empowering you, they're going to slow you down. You're going to have to find people more aggressive than you. Real guts. Two, you have to people at least as smart as you, really brainy. If you have the guts and no brains, you're a loose cannon. If you have the brains and no guts, you're a bureaucrat. Plenty of them out there. Smart people, pushing numbers. They go nowhere in life. And the guys who have all the guts and no brains, they can self-implode. But three, there's a third characteristic. It's how much you care, how much compassion you have, how much you want to help people. 
A lot of people don't think about that. It's all about the me generation. Me, 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 me. I'm so busy. Busy doing what? Why are you buying General Motors? Everybody's so busy with their little, little pathetic empire. You know? Nobody cares. This is what's missing. I don't know what your political uh, um, you know, thoughts are. This is what Trump is. He is very gutsy. He is very brainy, and he cares a lot about people and connects with them. And that's why he's super, super successful. Everything is relative, of course. Anyway, I don't want to do a speech here, but this is important. This is the foundation of what we're doing at the Financial Policy Council. We're not here an organization just to do events. Oh, we're doing a nice event, we do nice networking, let's come. No, no. Is to teach, to empower, to inspire, to do events, to create wealth, to interact, to connect, to do all these things. We're not just an event organization here. So anyway, for this specific events, so we, we do an event every six weeks. We talk about different asset classes. Today we're going to talk about IP, monetization of IP, creating wealth. Very interesting asset class. Every time we address a different asset class, and how do we make money in that asset class? What matters for you is your pocket, and for us. What matters for, you, for us is your pocket. We're not talking about theory, the theory of IP. This is not academia. This is not Harvard Business School. How do you make money? So I'd like to thank, number one, our board of directors who are every day instrumental in building this organization, please stand up for a big round of applause. <laughs> I also would like to thank our 40 sponsors so far, too long to name each, and particularly our current supporters, Magic Number and Neo IP. Thank you. Great group of panelists and experts we have today. Uh, without further delays, please meet our four panelists, all super successful individuals in their own right. The key when we get panelists is to have skin in the game. We don't invite people to pontificate. These are not academics, theoreticians. These are business people. I start with Taylor Brockman, Chief Technology Officer of Magic Number. Taylor. <laughs> Jinan Glasgow-George, CEO and co-founder of Magic Number. <laughs> Martin Renkis, CEO of SmartView Cloud Services at Johnson Controls. <laughs> Victoria Corineva, Managing Director, Patent Financing at IPW. So the way it works, I'm going to ask them some questions, and then I'm going to leave it up to you to address any questions you have for them, and then uh, we'll take it from there. So let's do first things first. If you could please, each one of you, in no more than a couple of minutes, talk about your personal and professional background. Share with the audience. We start with you, Taylor. Thank you. Instead of reading your resume, I think this is better to come from the horse's mouth. Wonderful. Thank you all for attending this session tonight. My background is software. So I build software from nothing into small, medium businesses. In my background, I've raised, uh, my companies have raised on the order of 250 million, uh, all venture capital. So one firm we got up to, uh, Series I, uh, then Carl <laughs> Icahn used it to do a reverse IPO with InfoSpace. Uh, I am the guy inside the company doing the product. So I understand the customers, I understand the engineers, but most importantly, I'm, I understand what the market needs. You can be too early. You can be way too early and run out of gas. You can be too late and never reach the competition. 
And so what I hunt for is that middle space where you're on time with the right product to the right customer. I'm an avid offshore sailboat racer, and I love being out there on night watch, under the stars, navigating the boat, and that really lets my mind unwind and find that deep flow of where my true ideas come from. Very nice to meet you. Thank you, Taylor. Nice. Jinan? He's a great partner. Thank you all for coming. I'm Janan Glasgow-George. I'm a recovered engineer. I myself am a serial entrepreneur. I'm a patent attorney of 20 years this year. Um, and I'm an angel investor and recently have joined a VC firm um, in the Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina area. I believe every one of us is created in God's image and likeness and we all have the power to create. The problem is we don't exercise it. I'm in that space of ideas transformed into reality that turn into assets that create wealth. That's what I love to see. So we work very often with serial entrepreneurs from high technology to biotechnology. I have a great team and great software with Taylor on board for Magic Number. We use machine learning and we're moving into AI to help identify trends for investment. Because investment in patents always leads the market investment. It has to. So it's a fun space. I hope you'll dialogue with me tonight about it. Thank you. Thank you, Jinan. <laughs> Martin? Uh, Martin Rankis from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, serial entrepreneur. Ran Kool-Aid stands. Sold anything I could find in the house down the street. <laughs> That's, that's who I am. Uh, I've started uh, a number of different companies, uh, one in the e-learning space. Uh, most recently, I uh, started a company called SmartView, and we're in the cloud video surveillance space. So we built a platform that uploaded uh, more than twice as much video as YouTube every day to the cloud, 72 million minutes of uh, surveillance video. So we built a platform that would secure, capture, transport, manage, and distribute uh, video. Uh, that company was acquired just a year ago by Johnson Controls. So now I lead the cloud uh, services division and the security uh, end of things for Johnson Controls. Uh, it's been a great company. They have a good, uh, a good vision on, on where they're going. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm passionate about creating uh, new ideas, new products, and, and bringing them to market. So awesome. I'm a fly fisherman, by the way, too. Love it. Thank <laughs> you. Almost close to sailboat. <laughs> Victoria? Hi, my name is Victoria Koreneva, uh, short for Vita. Probably easier to remember than the Russian last name. <laughs> um, I'm coming from a securitization structuring background. I've worked for KPMG for many, many years, and many different banks uh, auditing, but also structuring over 300 deals and transactions of all kinds and different assets. Um, um, and then I moved to, to New York from DC, uh, worked for Deutsche Bank in their global uh, department of capital markets. And uh, when I don't do this, I sing opera. Wow, <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know that. That's fantastic. All right. <laughs> okay, let's go so over some of the questions I have, then I'll leave it up to the audience. Now, why is it so important to evaluate your patent before you launch a business? Any one of you can answer that. Why is it that important? Well, I'll give it a go. Please. So, really, any business starts with an idea. And as you know, not every idea is a good idea. And not every idea is patentable, and not every patent is profitable. And so one of the things you always have to think about is, how is this going to be used as an asset in my business to bring a return? Patents are expensive. So you have to identify, what's the goal? How will I use it? And you can, maybe, I love this quote for the year, in a vacuum, you can convince yourself of anything. But you need some data, you need some context. So you can't just have, here's my patent, here's my invention, now here's a company. What, what does the competition have? Is this one patent enough to get me where I'm going? Maybe Martin has a good answer to that. In full disclosure, he's a former client. And he came to me when he was starting SmartView and said, uh, Janan, hey, I'd like to file a patent. I said, let's talk okay. about it. Do you need one patent or do you need 10 patents? And that turned into a few more than 10. Just but, a few more. 
It can be the source of value from the start of your company. If you're raising money, how to negotiate new contracts. You have exclusivity. People will want to work with you. Companies will want to work with you. And then ultimately, the valuation for you on exit. I was going to ask you about that. But uh, anybody would like to comment on this before we move to the next question? I'm happy to, happy to add to that. Uh, so from, from my perspective, I was out raising funding for this company that I just described to you. And in my first meeting, I'm sitting in this big office with this potential investor, and I lay out this vision of where we're going. And this person says, do you have any patents? And I said, no, I don't have any patents. He said, you better go get some patents. And I'm like, OK, I don't really know much about patents. So this was 25 years ago. So I uh, started that whole process. And, and then when, when we moved into that step, that's when I contacted Janan. And I knew, that having, uh, I knew that having this intellectual property, for me, very selfishly, in a very short, I was just trying to get to the point of raising funds. And I needed something to give me that. I wasn't thinking in the long term yet. I had to learn about that. So for me, it was getting those patents filed and then using that as leverage to help raise funds. So the valuation of the patent was really critical at that point to make it so it would be something that I could use as a vehicle for, for fundraising mostly. And then the story goes from, from there. But I don't know, Taylor, if I don't know if you wanted to add something to that. Yes, I've seen it on that the top end when there is the liquid event. It's just, it's a coefficient, it's a multiplier on top of your base revenue value if you have a strong portfolio that matches it. So if you want to create top end value, it's so inexpensive to start with your IP strategy at the beginning, because then it'll grow with you. And when you eventually have that liquid event, it's a multiplier effect. Actually, Taylor, you said you didn't even want to start magic number if we couldn't get a patent on it, right? <laughs> That's right. You want to know that you have a chance to differentiate yeah. mm -hmm. right off the bat. Victoria, you want to add something? Fine. OK. All right. So how have you used uh, patents to raise capital, whether early stage, later stage, whether in a tech venture or otherwise? I'll, I'll be happy to start on that. Please. So uh, we used IP quite a bit in our fundraising process. Uh, I told you about really our first, our first rounds of funding, which were, were angel rounds. Fifty hundred thousand dollar investments. Uh, we uh, we built a, a pretty phenomenal portfolio of where we wanted to go, the patents we wanted to file. Uh, spent quite a bit of time uh, 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 building a roadmap of where I thought the future was going to go. And as those patents became granted, as the company uh, as the company grew, and we went for a Series A round, Series B round, we raised additional capital. Uh, we used those patents uh, heavily in our pitch for capital. We said, here's our technology, here's our customers, here's the market, here's our future revenue growth, here's our intellectual property, here's the value of that intellectual property. We'd get third party valuations of, that, uh, of the patents and then we had our own mapping that we would do and said, we believe the patents are worth this much and here's where things are going. Uh, so that was uh, in, the, in the middle of the section there and then uh, about a year and a half before we got acquired, uh, we were out to raise additional funding to take the company to the next level. Uh, we were contacted by uh, Fortress uh, out on the West Coast, and um, this was before the whole um, uh, the whole debacle with the one drop of blood thing. <laughs> Theranos. Yeah, Theranos. Before the whole Theranos debacle, but so uh, Fortress came to us and said, "We have this new financial vehicle, and we're funding uh, IP portfolios." Uh, are you guys interested? We said, well, sure, we're interested. So we went and talked to them, and some of the interest certainly was, uh, uh, you know, reductions of dilution for, for my investors. I said, hey, look, we're going to take this capital. We're not, we're not diluting our investors. Uh, uh, second, uh, we, uh, uh, we had uh, access to this capital from a, from a very large organization that really wanted to stand behind us. So uh, we, uh, uh, we received a $15 million uh, line against our, uh, against our uh, patent portfolio. Wait, just against patents? Yeah. Nothing else put in there? Just against patents. Just that patents. was it. Just patents. That's pretty <laughs> exceptional. No, I'm pointing that out because that's exceptional. Yeah. What, what else will you do if the company doesn't pay back the loan? All you have in this hand are the patents. How is that going to work for them? What did they think they're going to yeah. do? So, I mean, for them, they evaluate the patents, and then they figure out what they're going to do, whether they're going to... Assert license. Right? Yeah. 
I always think, Ziad, if you will, from the beginning, you want to think about using patents in your operating company to keep competition out. You want to own the market, own your zone, right? Keeping people out lets you increase your growth faster, value pricing, more profit for sure. Um, then the second phase probably will be looking at your competition. You want to keep them away, sure, but what are they doing? Larger companies are more likely to buy the small companies if they have something the larger company doesn't. That's what patents are about. It's a unique asset that has real value in the hands of the small company, but whoa, larger company, they have larger distribution and larger competition. If they can use your patents to keep their competition out, think about it. Apple doesn't really care about patent trolls. They care about Samsung. That's hundreds of millions of dollars of profit every quarter that's being eaten into by their biggest competitor. If you have patents that they can use against their biggest competitor, that's value. Think of Google when they got into the mobile. Very interesting. The, the mobile phone business, they didn't have very many patents, but Apple was number one in profit and number one in patents for the touch user interface. Come on, you guys all have this thing, right, in your pocket. Number one in patent, number one in profit. What happened? They bought Motorola Mobility for over $11 billion and then sold off the operating company for about $3 billion. What's the difference? Patents. Patent assets made the difference there. Anybody wants to add something here? Victoria, you want to talk about the financing of patents? Sure, absolutely, and I think it's prime time to do it, especially after the exactly. introduction. Yes, um, IPW that I am representing, we have a vision. You must have heard that from somewhere, right? <laughs> we have a vision for patents to be a separate asset class, and this is not the future. We actually work to make it the present. So far, the transactions that have been taking place in the market, they uh, usually would put patents as a bundle offer with other asset types. It's, it, just, it, it found its uh, lenders, found its borrowers, found its marketplace, but this is not the future that we see. We want to contribute and facilitate the growth of patents as a separate standalone asset class and provide capital to that space. IPWE um, had created a ecosystem, an ecosystem that should, should be able to do that, to facilitate this development. We have partnered with Templum Capital uh, Markets, uh, Capital Markets, um, that has a secondary trading platform. And I think that explains quite a bit about what you're gonna do with the patent once you buy it, right? You gotta have some outlet. You have to have um, some liquidity vehicle that will provide you an opportunity to either uh, divest it or trade it or whatever else or lease it out and it's it's now it's the reality now it's just a matter of us all uniting and developing it um, but there are many many things that I'm excited about and I want to share but I want to no no please go ahead share now <laughs> yeah yeah please feel free to well I think when um, not knowing exactly the background of everybody here I think it's important to establish what really patent financing is and I think I already kind of started saying that mm -hmm. um, it's kind of funny, I started Googling, I'm like, I'm curious what's out there um, online. When you Google, it, it talks about financing your patent because it's such a big area where companies spend money and effort and resources. But when you actually look at what patent financing is, it's essentially, right, it's essentially uh, being able, if you're a patent owner, to take this asset, because it has a value, and use it as collateral to have access to capital that you would not otherwise have. Interesting. Like Martin's case. Yeah, exactly yep. what we did. Yeah, yep, yep. Exactly. And this is great because this is a prime example of reality being here today. Um, but just imagine if we take this asset class and um, instead of having one-off transactions here and there, um, we actually make it a real uh, asset class that finds its commonplace in the marketplace, right? We're all not surprised that mortgage-backed securities or, or you know, 
asset-backed securities, CMBSs, RMBSs, God knows what, but somehow patents are such a new asset class that has, uh, has to have a life of its own and we're working to make it happen. It's so interesting that patents have been around for hundreds of years, right? It's part of why our constitution, right? <laughs> why our economy has been so amazing in the United States of America because you can make your ideas into something that's a transferable asset, which is exactly what you're talking about. So why has it taken this long for that to happen? I think one reason is patents are kind of boring to read. They're a little bit tedious. If you can read them. So <laughs> Interestingly, for every other asset class in a company, major companies, small companies alike, you know everything about that asset. You can get a report, there's somebody who can give you information about how are we getting a return on this asset. You can't do it with patents. There's so much data and it's really been hard to analyze it. Most of the time it's been handed off to a patent attorney. And what we're finding with Magic Number is the data is actually today available. When I started, it was all manual reading through paper. It wasn't until two th around 1999, 2000 that the US Patent Office put their patent data online, searchable. You used to have to physically go there. So nobody's known, it's been this shroud of kind of boring mystery, and yet the most value for the companies. So this is a, brilliant. I'm glad to hear about what you are creating. Just to add a little bit more, uh, and that's exactly right. And, and uh, it's prime time to have something that has a, a depository of all this information in one place. And IPV was able to get this. Um, we have a so-called global registry of patents where for free you can actually go and check it out. Uh, essentially, a lot of information had been pulled from all kinds of offices, patent offices around the world. And now it's in this one huge database that's um, backed by blockchain technology mm -hmm. and also with the use of artificial intelligence. Uh, it's all possible now and it's all there for free use. You, you're welcome to check it out, ipwe.com. Um, and I think that's, those steps are first ones to take it from step from, from walking to running and eventually to really enjoy all the benefits that, that we can potentially uh, unlock. Going that's forward. fascinating. Okay, let me ask you, how, how does our patent system here in the United States compare to the rest of the world in terms of technology, in terms of progress, in terms of wealth creation, et cetera? Is it, it's much more advanced, isn't it? Actually, the U.S. patent system has always been number one in By the far. world. It's not currently the number one in terms of the, the volume or the number of new inventions filed. That's China. The government has been behind sort of pushing that. There are now over a million filings per year. Oh, the really? US, the U.S. is about half, just over half a million per year. But over half of the patents filed in the U.S., or about half, come from outside. The people filing are from outside. That's because our market is so great. And the enforceability of the patent, that improves the value of this asset class because we have rule of law. There's some business predictability about the value of the patent if it's transferred and someone else can then step in the shoes and enforce it. And that's it. why they bring it to the United States. Because that's of why the, the U.S. is great. What's yes. happening in China, um, yeah is that you may now get enforcement, right? You'll get some damages, but it could be vacated because the, the, it's not rule of law. It's not the same system. And very often, even if you have a judgment, if there's a local company employing, they might say, in fairness, we'll wipe that judgment out mm. because employment. That doesn't happen in the US in the same way. So it's important that we maintain um, reliable rule of law and property ownership, part of our constitution, is something that we have to diligently assert. And I think we have to watch out for this in the sort of what appears to be a bit of a wave of property is no good Very socialism. Right? <laughs> so what does it mean to create you know, unlimited uh, power in creating wealth you know, with the patents? I mean, if you can give some example, how do you create unlimited power wealth with patents? Give some example. Well, I, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll start with some. So I would, I would say that our, our, our investment in, uh, in patents, uh, 
at least a 12x return on our investment in, in patents, and mm -hmm. that was just uh, uh, our investment in, in researching, financing those patents. But outside of the, the cash return, there's some really interesting ways that we use patents. Uh, one of the things we did is, uh, uh, so my current CTO, I was trying to get him to join our team, and uh, he can pretty much call his shots on whatever salary he wants to pay, anyone's going to pay that, he's a very talented engineer. Uh, so when you talk to someone like that and you say, uh, look, um, here's our patent portfolio, here's all the technologies we've invented, we were the first that did all this, and by the way, here's the whole future, and we're going to do all of this, and we're going to follow these patents, and we're not only are we going to invent it, we're going to own it. And that makes for a really you know, exciting story. So when we hire people, uh, we use that. We have bounties at the company, so when engineers are developing or salespeople even come up with an idea for a patent, like, hey, we filed a patent, it gets granted, here's $2,000. And it. you're now a hero. You're sitting at our little lunch party and we're having pizza and you're a hero. Uh, so we, we try to create this culture of, of, uh, of intellectual property uh, creation. But, uh, but there's one, just one simple example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love that. And as an asset class, this is one reason why it's unique. Where, where does everything begin? It originates here. Yep. The people, the intellectual capital of your business are that resource that's got an unlimited supply of potential future assets. So encouraging exposure to other information is very helpful. So that's one reason with Magic Number, it's an advantage, the more you can see, the more you can invent, because you only can invent from what you know. The more you're exposed to, the more ideas, the more trends, the more it stimulates the idea machine here. Um, you know, if you think, here's an example, a, a, a company that deals in sleep technology. We're all sleeping occasionally, right? Hopefully nobody right now. Um, <laughs> It's, it's a common thing, and yet the most valuable patents, every patent's inventive solution to a problem, they're solving real problems. People have sleep problems. The number one factor in problems with sleeping is temperature. So a company uh, known as Chili Technologies launched something called the Chili Pad. And if you, anyone reads, Tim Ferriss has a book called Titans, where he looks across the wealthiest celebrities, the um, the, the athletic uh, superstars, the business rock stars, actual rock stars, if you will. The one thing everybody had in common was a chili pad. Because if you don't get a good night's sleep, you're not going to be able to have the stressful day that you need to have. You won't be able to do everything that you need to do as a business person, as an athlete. You won't recover. Your body, your brain won't be in as good of a shape. So they all had that one thing. That was a great solution, and they've now evolved it. Next generation patents, more assets, more value in the company, more people sleeping better, more money. It's a great example. So, so is it ever too early to file for patents? Um, that's a great question. There are a lot of crappy patents out there. <laughs> There are. There's a lot of crap, just like there's crappy real estate or there's crappy businesses, if you will, that aren't profitable. I said not every patent's profitable. Yeah, there's a lot. Most of them are filed without looking at data. It's just what have we done? In that vacuum, you can convince yourself of anything. But if you put some context around it, that's where you get some value. So when you look at assets as a class, patent assets as a class, you have to have a way to sort through that. You have to have data. Whether you're using our software or somebody else's, don't try to do it in a vacuum. You'll have crap and you'll waste your money. We went through uh, quite a bit of this process as we vetted our ideas for patents. Uh, we would do things, for example, uh, er early in the days of the company, the whole concept of plugging in a camera and automatically having that camera connect to a system that would manage it. Uh, it was just an idea we had. We were saying, hey, let's try to make it easier for people to set up surveillance systems and manage surveillance systems. So we had probably 110 ideas like that, and we started with these ideas, and then we'd, we'd trim them down and trim them down and trim them down and trim them down. We did all the research, and they really came up with what was a, a really nice portfolio. So we started out with what we thought was valuable, 
And then we thought, what, what is a, a realistic patent, something that we could get that would have uh, uh, ultimate value in the market? So that's a, certainly a, a process that mm -hmm. we've, we've gone through using all to, different types of software. That you have yeah. to keep doing, keep doing, yeah. keep building on it. But that's the unlimited part. Mm -hmm. It can continuously grow. That was the whole point of Jefferson setting up the patent office in the first place. Keep the innovation flowing. Learn about what other people are doing. Solve the problem in a better, faster, more valuable way. That's how you get valuable patents. So let's be a little bit practical here. How can our audience here, the participants at this event, take action to create wealth from their ideas? Most pragmatic way of going about it. Very simple, step by step. I'd like to ask this to each one of you, starting with you, Taylor. Thank you. My ask of you would be to, before you jump into a new venture, before you start building a new product, actually look at what's out there. It changes every week. And to me, time is so precious, especially when it's around product development. Now, one of the things that haunts me is I know that software is becoming commoditized. It's becoming easier and easier to write. And I know that there's armies out there of software engineers that are better than me. And so I need to make sure that what I'm working on is not only unique, but it's also protected. Because I can't spend two years burning with my team just to find out, oh, they've already did that three years ago. Right. That would be a huge mistake. And so I guess creating that value is in not misstepping right at the incubation of your new project. Interesting. That's a good point. I think um, if I have to say the number one, the first step, well, maybe can I have two? Yes. <laughs> number one is you come up with an idea, pay attention to it, write it down. You have a vision, write it down, make it plain, make it clear and concise so you can communicate it. At looking at context is great. So number one is like start paying attention to your ideas for sure. And then the next thing is um, I think you have to think even bigger. Most people start too small. They, tar they start too small. So if you think you've got something, communicate, write it down, communicate it, and get other feedback and input. Make it bigger. If it's something you can execute on now, it's not big enough. Make it so big that you're not sure you can do it. And that's where you've got So big value. that you're scared of your idea. That's right. That <laughs> only with God's help, you're going to yep. get it done. I know what you mean. Yeah. And a few hundred lawyers. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Martin? Uh, well, I uh, probably at a, at, a, at a very very practical side, I, I always looked at it from a, from a fundraising side. I've always been an idea guy. I think it's great, and I think these are some phenomenal uh, uh, advice and, and, and guidance. Uh, certainly the brainstorming of ideas is something that I, I love doing anyway, and that's getting together with the people that I think are great and smart and kick around ideas and, 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 and what, uh, uh, what can come from that. Uh, but but for, for me, I'd say at a very, very low practical level, it's filing, filing a good provisional patent or multiple provisional patents to help to get to that next step, whether it's their first round of funding, uh, and then how how the how people can use that to go to the next step. So if I was doing it all from scratch again, and I had didn't have the resources. That's exactly where I would start. I think it becomes oh, yeah. even more more important because once you have your patent and you actually want to monetize it. You bring this patent to you know, some, someone like us or a lender, and they have to assess a lot of factors of your patent, the value, validity, uh, all kinds of claims on this patent, correct? Mm -hmm, yes. And uh, you also want it to be a quality, uh, valuable proposition to, for the lender to be interested even dealing with you, let alone offer you an uh, interest rate that would be beneficial to your business and, and such. So it's cradle to grave, essentially, really important to have the quality uh, information um, in your patent. So it's really, if I recap here, finding the path of least resistance to monetize your patent. Uh, I think be, having a clear idea from the beginning that you're going to monetize, monetize it. Your Some patent. people say, if I just get a patent, it's like a lottery ticket, maybe worth a million bucks. Yep. Not if you don't do something with it. You, there's no patent police. There's nobody out there just waiting to buy your patent. You have to take action with it 
It's like any other asset. That's one, one thing I'd, I'd want to add that I've learned through this whole process mm -hmm. over the years is, uh, is the importance of the quality of the patent. Like you said, I have a patent and I'm a millionaire. I mean, a patent is a patent. There really are a lot of really bad patents. So just because the patent office says it's a patent doesn't mean it's a good patent. And that's something that, that we went through this whole process. I mean, having our portfolio evaluated by someone like Fortress and then loaning us money against it is a pretty big step. And, and that's because it was a solid portfolio. So uh, getting a patent, great idea, go for it, do it the right way. Uh, it's, it's worth the money. So uh, that would be some other advice. I'd Don't do it yourself. <laughs> Get some help, yep. professional help. Get someone who will ask you a lot of questions and maybe kick it, poke it, tell you maybe it's not gonna patent so that you build it around that, so that you improve it. Don't think you've got it all from the beginning. Yeah, and don't do it yourself. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna leave it to the audience here. Uh, those on this side can ask their question here on this mic and those here over there, so. All right. Uh, announce your name, your affiliation, and then you ask your question. And please, no comments, questions. <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth uh, Ramos. Ke I, I'm, I'm going to start with Catherine. Oh, okay. Catherine Baysmore, Cocoon Resources. I'm interested, you were talking about present day. And so today, when you're looking at monetizing an IP portfolio, right now, I know that the regulations for regular banking are very difficult to use collateral, collateralized IP portfolios. So today, are you just going to venture capital and other type of uh, capitalization firms that will use a portfolio to do that? And how do you see the regulatory um, climate changing to allow banks to start actually writing checks? Great question. Um, I guess I'll take that, right? Uh, you're exactly right. Uh, usually, uh, and up until today, uh, the transactions have been taking place between private parties. And that's correct that usually it's family offices and hedge funds that are extending liquidity to companies that have patents on their books and would like to get funding. Um, in terms of um, development that's already happening. I mentioned the secondary trading platform, uh, but also um, we, IPW is assisting in originating those deals. So you just, we need to qualify the patents, number one, of course, and portfolios. <coughs> and number two, um, really see how you're gonna use the funds and also whether you can sustain the level of liquidity that you're asking for based on the cash flow expectations. Usually these are leasing arrangements that are providing income uh, to the deal, right? Um, in terms of going forward, we see that with developing this asset, uh, we're gonna have more interest from a wider spectrum of lenders. We should open up uh, the platform for more deals and more interest, not only from lenders, but also from more companies realizing that, wait a second, I do have this asset and let me explore, maybe it's valuable. In terms of regulatory, um, uh, with such development, it's inevitable that there will be uh, rating of uh, these transactions and asset type, uh, which will bring you know, higher than subpar great uh, uh, assets to market as well. Thank you. Great response. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Kenneth Ramos. I work for Stiefel, Managing Director. So I'm a big fan of algorithms. From Computer Science 101 to formally define a problem, characterize all the moving parts, is to solve it by 50%. With that being said, to the best of my knowledge, the patent industry is highly inefficient, fragmented, cost of entry very high, barriers and so forth. This question's for any one of you. What can be done to, and before I ask the question, I will say that um, in my view, the industry is ripe for disruption, blockchain, machine learning, AI, internet of things or a combination thereof. What can be done to systematize, streamline that industry, make it more cost effective because what does technology do at the end of the day? Compress spreads and margins. Great. Taylor, why don't you talk about the use of machine learning yes. in disrupting patent search? Mm -hmm. So one of the recent innovations is a standardized classification system. 
a tagging system that is respected internationally. And as more forces both in the government patent office as well as external vendors, professional services vendors and software vendors align around that tagging system, new things are emerging. Uh, what's especially a, a catalyst is that the, the full text and the full images are available. And if you have the wherewithal to crawl it, extract it, run it through your ML and reach these conclusions, you can find things that no army of people could ever find in their careers because the machines can do it so quickly. So I think punchline is that the, this new classification system is an accelerant to integrating the te technology with the legacy processes. Is it's a, a good start. It? <laughs> I would say the patent office for a long time has had this problem. When I worked there as an examiner, it was a manual search and the computer was optional. <laughs> that was in the mid 90s, you know, so not that long ago that it was all manual. But then the error rate there was pretty high. By some standards, um, I think maybe uh, uh, MCAM was suggesting it was between th like 32 and over 50% risk of validity challenge. And this, this is a stat from the early 2000s. Hopefully that's gone down a little bit with more software and more searching. But one of the, one of the big issues that's that ripe for disruption is why the heck would you ever build something without, like a house, without an architectural plan? Yes. Why the heck would you turn something over to a patent attorney who says, here's my hourly rate and materials are extra, and you have no idea what you're going to get until he's written, he or she has written it, built it, and maybe it's not right. That's going to cost you more. Why the heck would you do that? It's been changing. We're seeing many companies have been negotiating flat rates. For, this is something that's predictable. Since I launched my first practice in the late 90s, we've always done stage gate fixed rates. I think that's becoming more common, and I think that's one thing that will help improve the entry, if you will. And the other thing is, I think, skin in the game. Yep. There are more patent attorneys who are willing to invest and get behind things. Yep. Um, I think that's a good place to do. The other thing, negotiate. Negotiate a better deal. Doesn't have to be the high cost unknown thing that, that it is for many people today. Good I'd, question. I'd Excellent. like to add one thing on that. I, I like the whole concept of democratizing this process because there are these huge barriers to entry and how, how can you make wealth creation faster getting from that idea that somebody has to creating something that's an asset exactly. that you might be interested in. So um, I, I don't know what the answer is, but things that pop in my head are, wouldn't it be a fantastic to have some type of a service that an entrepreneur could use uh, that would use AI, and it would use all these different technologies to help them maybe even just get a provisional patent done. This goes against a lot of things I was saying earlier about quality. So you'd have to somehow <laughs> ensure quality. It's a, it's a hell of a conundrum, but I think there's something there to like multiply that wealth creation by, by democratizing, you know, protecting these assets, these ideas that people come up with. Victoria, you want to add something? Yes, I think machines are as good as what people tell them to be. <laughs> and ultimately, we are the people tell them how to make money, but we have to have that vision. And uh, I think that's that's essentially, then we structure different things in order to accomplish that task. Uh, and with patents, it's very important to realize that from the internal and external research, from spending money to value a patent, then spending money to transact, and then contract management, I'm talking already when you have a patent and you want to actually do something with it and, and monetize it can cut into your final destination 40 to 50% from where you started. And nowadays, given the um, tools that uh, I have to you know, speak about IPV, yeah. that IPV has, and also the artificial intelligence um, and blockchain, it allows us, the technology it allows us to do, those crazy uh, transaction costs are cut significantly. You, you may end up with only 10% from the pie rather than 45. Mm -hmm. But it all involves collaborating with all the parties, just not, not cutting them out, but collaborating efficiently. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. No, no, no. Enough. Excellent.
Uh, Michael Miron, M2 Advisors. I wonder if you could comment on how you see patents used in operations. I think uh, Joanne commented briefly that it nominally provides an exclusive practice for your product line. But I'm wondering how often you see successful licensing programs or whether people assert them through patents, lawsuits, or participation in standards bodies and backing them with the essential IP in patent pools or as part of cross licenses, which I've seen large companies to do. And secondly, what percentage of the patents are actually monetizable directly like, uh, like that? The last time I looked at IBM, they would let some 20% of them roll off their patent portfolio because they just weren't worth much and they'd file 20% new. When I sat on Xerox's uh, committee that approved this, we saw the same thing. Only a tiny fraction you could license directly. The rest of them were there as a big thicket uh, to erect as part of these defensive mechanisms. Sure. I, well, I'll take a first stab at that. I think if you look at uh, Henry Chesbro's research, um, in open business models. He interviewed a lot of major public companies, including IBM. How much of your patent portfolio are you using? Most of them didn't know, because it's this huge data issue that I mentioned earlier. But the ones who did said between 10, 15, maybe 25%. The universities, research, they're so, it's billions of dollars poured into research. Usually their number's less than five. I think the, the most valuable patent quality that, we're, that we tend to see and the most use in a company is the early stage companies because you have to make them work. I'll give you a specific example in software. We worked with the company TogetherSoft in the early 2000s. They had, they were venture capital backed, about $20 million. They had part of a portfolio in the ground software based and they had no idea what they had. When we looked at it, half of them not directly uh, involved in their current business. So it's something that you always have to continue to look at and call some things out. When your business pivots, so should your patent portfolio. Um, so you know, maybe there's a thought there is that larger companies need to be more proactive about that analysis, the ongoing analysis of the portfolio and calling out. A lot of times when a company pivots, the patents aren't valuable to them, but very valuable to someone else. So a secondary market, it's brilliant, it's a great thing. There's more funding today than ever before for companies to do assertion. So that shouldn't be the bar. That being said, it's mostly happening in high tech. There's not a lot really, maybe a little biomedical that's happening, it's not much. Most patent cases settle, like 98%. So you still have to have the asset to get you there. You need money to get there. Maybe some other options um, uh, will be like some other tokenization uh, or other support for these things. You need money to make money. There's no exception here. Yep. Martin, you had some unique ways of using patents in the business though that you mentioned like hiring key people. Yeah, I mean, we, we, used, we used it in marketing on a regular basis. Uh, at, at one point, we were uh, targeting really large strategic customers. So Time Warner Cable was one of them. And uh, we went and did our pitch, and here's technology, and here's how it works, and here's how great it is, and here's how we'll take care of you. Uh, and, uh, and a big part of our pitch was that we're innovators. We invent this. We invented a lot of this technology that people use today. Uh, and um, and uh, not only have we invented this, that we are protected. We have this technology. Uh, and then we talk about a roadmap. And so if you're gonna do business with us, Here's where we're going. And we can talk about this freely with them because we filed the patent already. So we use it on, on the sales side. Uh, and then, then we'd also talk about how it might protect them if they were sued. So uh, there's, there's quite a bit that we used on our, uh, on our sales side uh, as well and marketing side. And, and we, ha we always highlight that we're an innovation company and uh, that's always an attractive, uh, attractive part of, uh, of using it also on the operations side. Licensing is very opaque. People can't see into it. But I do think the blockchain, something that will make that more transparent yet secure, will be beneficial. You mentioned the blockchain. Yeah, I have a little bit of still data here. Go ahead, Victoria. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, so apparently from 1995 to 2013, the pledge of patents as collateral had grown from 10,000 to 50,000. So that's, that's a positive development. On a pra practical side, right now we're working on a deal um, which involves someone, uh, a company, that has a patent, very valuable one, and of course there, there had to be an assessment of the quality of the patent and things like this, and validity of claims and, and, and ownership, um, that 
needs the money, needs the funding, go to market. They need to take the products out into the market. And so um, the deal is structured in such a way that it's a securitization. It's been put in an SPV. And through that, all the uh, leasing revenues or royalty uh, income will be flowing uh, from the sales and from the leasing arrangements that they will have. It's very, very, it's, it, we're working on it. That's a good nice. structure. Mm. Nice. All right, uh, Stan? Uh, Stan Silverman, Minerva Capital Management. Um, from what I've heard you say, um, I understand there are probably tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of patents domestically and internationally which are out there which most people don't know anything about uh, uh, and of all different values. Uh, are there any companies that r uh, evaluate, buy up these patents, and then based upon the quality that they see in the patents, sell shares uh, to individuals who want to invest uh, as they try to monetize these patents? Oh, that's a good Great question. question. <laughs> um, I haven't seen that happening yet. It doesn't mean that it's not happening. It would tend to be a private deal. I would seriously doubt if they would just buy up the large volumes of patents, but rather target specific industries or areas like that. The, the opportunity is there. Patent data is public. So uh, if that's an interesting business model to you, I say run with that. You can find things that are there that are available and acquire them. I think aggregating things in an area makes them perhaps more interesting and then securitizing it by people investing. If the issue comes down to uh, a, a diamond, uh, excuse me, a diamond's value is only known by a jeweler. <laughs> uh, uh, a person who sells apples doesn't know what the value of a diamond is. I'm an apple seller, not a, not a jeweler. And so I need a patent attorney or a group of patent attorneys who evaluate patents and then place them into different categories of value that I could then buy shares in when they go out to monetize it. I don't want to uh, be a, a patent no, evaluator. Sure. I want to be an investor. So That's interesting. I, I, I want to add something to that I think is a really a good point that Janan said. I, I think that this would be a focused type of a, a opportunity where you'd say, well, look, we're going to focus on this area of healthcare, or this, care, this area of high technology, and then build that portfolio by, those, by these patents that are in those specific areas. Uh, but like you said, I mean, you're going to need someone who's an expert in that area <laughs> to build that. And it's, it's not that patents have one value. It is more valuable depending on who owns it, of course. right? So there is something, it's a good parallel to real estate. I know there's some real estate uh, developers and investors here. Proximity matters. The closer you are to larger entities that themselves are investing, that's great. The direction of technology evolution, if you're on that trend, that's good. Earlier is better. There are a number of factors that would be used to evaluate. I do think in a focused sector, Aggregating is something that would be valuable. That's not really done today, but it could be. So it, we're, we're it could little, be. It's a little ahead in time as opposed to ha happening right now. It can't be done now. Yes, but I do think the work that Vic Victoria is doing. Yeah. IP We actually does look at portfolios of patents. Um, please, you know, we can talk after this conference uh, specifically and then identify which ones would present interest uh, to, to be packaged or you know whether they will be appropriate for uh, something else, potentially leasing arrangement or potentially sell out. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Joe? Well, Stan stole my question. <laughs> and it okay. was looking at trading, buying, selling patents, aggregating patents, and looking at un unexpired patents. And I think you answered it, but I didn't want to. Patents away. on their own, I, and I like what, what your firm is, the IPD is doing, um, pat, but just patents on their own aren't valuable without a, somewhere connecting it to commercial action. You have to have business around it. The problem has to have customers that want the solution for it to be valuable to someone. So the data and context is going to help you find that. But at the end of the day, just to pat in over here, leave that apple in the cart. Look for something that's connected to the yeah. business. Yeah, you. 
Doesn't yeah, that, so that question, in, oh, real quickly though, that, that question also uh, uh, addresses the de democratization thing. I mean, if everybody had this opportunity to buy into, hey, buy a share in my patent portfolio. Anybody can buy. You don't need to know anything about patents. You know, buy a share, by you know, wealth creation, by monetizing these ideas and somehow making it accessible to more people. I think it's a great. Just to add, I mean, <laughs> In a, in a deal structure, there is a conversion clause that allows for the lender to exchange the uh, interest in the deal to actual uh, equity, to actual uh, stock. So it exists in the deal practically right now. It's just not available to you know, the, the public uh, as potentially you were addressing. But in terms of private uh, money having ability to convert it, yes, it's there. Ian Haft, uh, Surger's Capital. Um, about five years ago, the Patent Office implemented the inter-party review. Oh, sorry, could you raise your voice a bit? We can't hear oh, you. I'm sorry. About five years ago, the Patent Office implemented the inter-party review and in which um, uh, either side in a patent dispute can take a patent to a panel who really is mainly charged with invalidating patents. And surprise, surprise, they invalidate north of 80% of the patents. Wow. How has that new process, which has been litigated and seems to be constitutionally valid, um, affected the value of patent portfolios? It's a good question. As you can guess, it's gone down. We've seen the markets have gone down. Uncertainty makes the value go down. This risk of the patent being invalidated makes it go down. The Alice 101, is it pat our software patents patentable value going down? But this is the magic of the practice of law. It changes, right? And it moves, or it, it shifts and it moves. Often what we see is typically pendulum. It's coming back. IPR is being reined back in a little bit. But most of the lobbying for ref reform in our patent system, it's by the largest companies who don't really want to be bothered by the smaller companies. And I think we have to be aware of that and be vigilant about anything that eats away at constitutional property rights of the American people. It's a fundamental building block of our economy. Very well said. Very yeah. well said. I agree. 100%. Yes, sir. Yep. Thank you, Zian. Alexander Yankovsky with uh, Computronics question. How can domestic filers protect themselves from Chinese copycats? Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> um, in theory, that would be done using uh, customs. I mean, you have to be the patent police. In practice, you have to have some partnership or roots on the ground in China. You've got to have some way to do enforcement in China. Most of the cases we've seen that tend to be very successful, can, there's some connection that the Chinese entities, even if it's the, um, the officials of the company, if they have assets in the US, that's how you get them. I see. You have to be able to do maybe not just US patents, but maybe China, US, and Europe. You have to be ready to fight that war on more than one front. It's expensive, but it's a war. Sorry. No good answer. Absolutely. Thank you. So I want to uh, so just introduce myself. Um, I'm, my name is Peter Thurlow. I'm a patent attorney for 25 years. I'm president of this IP Bar Association in New York, more than 1,000 members. Loving the discussion because so many evaluation meetings and so on we go to go into some of the issues that Janan talks about with 101 PTAB issues and evaluations going down. I can say, with respect to the China question, we've had the FBI and other government agencies up to our office many a times. It's a real concern uh, when you read about what's going on with President Trump and these issues. It's getting better with these trade deals, trying to stop the forced technology transfer. Uh, and then um, we've had now four meetings, just to Janan's point. Actually, the fourth meeting will be in April with the Senate and the House on what we call patentability issues, one-on-one, -on -one, especially with what Taylor's working on in uh, the software issue. So it's been a little bit challenging from a patent valuation standpoint, but we do believe it's coming back. And for those of you that me need more information, um, you know, we have that. So I really don't have a question other than just saying, I'm so excited to come to a meeting <laughs> where there's good discussion about the importance of, uh, of, of patents and the, Thank you. the IP. One, one thing I'll just raise for Janan to, uh, to answer, 
there's a misconception out there that patents are very expensive. Yes, I'll admit patent attorneys are, are, uh, are expensive, but there's maybe you could talk about track one, expedited review, and getting patents in a way that we can file a patent today and get a patent within a six year. months or so on. And it really helps. I think it's, uh, what's the gentleman's nice name? Martin. I really, Martin. Uh, it really helps for the startups work with 20 or 30 startups that you get the patents early on. It's really a great funding tool where the VCs, private equities, corporate VCs we work with don't understand all the nuances of IPRs and so on, but they understand that you're smart enough to get the protection there. So maybe, Janan, you can go into I that. guess the, the point I will make, I'm going to circle back to Ziad from the beginning and say, um, yeah, I mean, things change, values go down, the law shifts and all of that. You've got to adapt. You have to be willing to adapt. Exactly. You have to be willing to pivot. And the patent system is solid in this country. And it is still reliable. Patents are valuable. And for whatever the cost is, if you know you can get a 5x, 10x, 50x return on that investment, which you can in some cases with patents, it's worth the investment, Oof. even if it's expensive up front. Oof. Put some skin in the game and just get it. Exactly. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming in. I'm sorry. How can I forget my dear Barry? You're in a dark state. Please. Barry Monet, Financial Policy Council Groupie. I guess that's all I do. <laughs> my question is uh, very simple. How do you know when it's time to go talk to a lawyer? I have an idea, and when should I go find a lawyer? Now. So. Meet you after. <laughs> that was Sooner or better. <laughs> Sooner is better. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, our next event is on May 21st. Uh, we'll send you an announcement. In the meantime, uh, we're going to have a group picture here. So whoever wants to join us in the back here to have a group picture, which we keep all the time, year after year. And uh, hope to see you uh, very soon. Hope uh, you continue your support by bringing in your friends, your guests. As you can see, it's very educational, very empowering, very straight to the point, very pragmatic and practical. This is not theory. These are people in the trenches doing it every day. And please feel free to contact them, to tap into their resources. Yes. And have a great evening. Thank you. I'm happy to add that you may not be filing a patent yourself, but you probably know somebody. And we've put together a special offer for just y'all and your friends. There are invitations on the front table. <laughs> and we'll basically, whatever sector, whatever product, whatever idea you have, we'll give you our services for just our standard rate. So please grab a card or two and hand them out to your friends. Love Thanks it. Thank tonight. you.